Look, I need you watching our backs. You're a better shot than I am. Huh, really? No! Hello there, Sarah from 17 once again. This is my Gears of War 4 Insane Difficulty video walkthrough. This is Act 4, Chapter 4. Lots of 4s in this one. And it's called Powerless by a perfect circle. And it is... It has one of my least favourite fights in the entire game on this mission. And it's not because it's difficult, it's because your team are colossal douchebags that do nothing but hinder you. And I don't know if it's the level design, I don't know if it's the particular way that they designed the AI for our team to, to cover you here, but it is so rage-inducingly bad that you're going to be forced to push yourself forward. And every time you push yourself forward in this game, you put yourself in a danger zone. And... The closer you are to any enemy, the easier the situation can go wrong. And I know that sounds so obvious and so Gears of War-y, but it, it rings true in almost every situation. And this level is a long one, and it's a tough one because there's a lot of fights. And there's also some ones that are just not desirable at all. They're boring fights. And I don't want to say this to you guys, I don't want to put you off the game. I don't really want to complain about parts of Gears 4, because I wanted it to be great. But there are parts of it that are really shitty, and one of them is, is the AI on this level. They take this immense pleasure in making the game harder than it needed to be by stealing cover, by blocking shots, and by just getting in the way. And I'm sorry, but if this game is not 4 player co-op, why the fuck are they here? It makes no sense. Get rid of them. Give us one person. Why didn't they die at this point? You know, I'm not attached to either of them. It's like, come on now, I'm attached to Marcus, and all this game does is cuckold him the entire time. They turn him into some kind of fucking beta male where all his opinions don't matter because they're all these kids who disobey father figures and any kind of authoritarian, uh, you know, representative. So, boom, everything Marcus says is almost like nonchalant now because nobody gives a shit, nobody gives him any respect. And it's just, oh, dad being dad again, you're getting old. So it's just this weird situation of you have these new characters that JD's kind of okay, I guess, when he's not always pulling jokes in inappropriate times. Dell does almost nothing and is essentially sh the shadow of Chase, or Jace, or whatever it was called in the third game. I think he was called Jace. And then Kate is here essentially to give us some kind of emotional bond when there's a shoehorned love story that does nothing and comes out of nowhere. There's no real affection between the two characters to indicate that there's any kind of spark there because they've got the personalities of a lump of coal. And then at the end of the game, we're meant to really feel sorry for them for no other reason than just guilt through association. And that is not a good story, guys. I'm sorry, it isn't. So when we get to a section like this, where the team gets in my way, I want to fucking kill them. I want to pop their heads like it's multiplayer and there's friendly fire on because they're a pain in the ass. And the only person who I feel bad about is Marcus, because in the previous games he was a beast, because I was controlling him. And it, it just, it winds me up unrelentingly for no real reason, like... I was grinding my teeth, frothing at the bit, at the fight that follows this one, because I just got so pissed off. And I have no illusion here, guys, I'm under no illusion, I should say, that I could play this again, and maybe the AI would push out, and I'd get a good pattern. But... How many times do you play a game where you're literally praying for death? Like, can you see the frustration on me? This is frustration right now because I've died. Because I pushed forward because my team were pissing me off and I got killed. So right now, I'm just kind of like... I don't even want to do this fight, even though this is not the tricky one. This is the very manageable one. All I'm going to do is stay by these stairs and pepper people. But my team is using shotguns and they're all at distance. It's like, guys, move forward. You do not die. You're not even at risk. Move forward, you dickheads. Please, just move. She's throwing grenades, which is okay. Does it get him? Kinda. You notice how the radius on that grenade was really kind to him, yet the radius on the grenades against us, not so kind? Isn't that an interesting piece of uh, design there? There's that grenadier does a lovely dad jog and lands a grenade where they don't dodge. But if you're so attached to cover that you don't move for grenades, get the fuck out of my way. I don't get it. But this is the fight coming up, guys, after you've done that first bit. Uh, there's a doorway uh, just past here, and there's two pieces of cover on either side of it, and then there's kind of a long straight to get into the room. And that's it. This is it. Like, all I want to do here is take cover on the left side of this opening and do damage, but my team won't let me. And I've already resigned myself to, to being frustrated here, so I'm just going to look around to see if I can pick up some cool weapons. And uh, one of them just happens to be the Nasher, which... 
It doesn't help me too much because I'm not that close to the enemies, but who knows? I might be going in in this, which I don't imagine I will because it's dangerous. And I said at the beginning, you're not going to be seeing any kind of crazy high octane wall bouncing shotgun death matches because you can't do it on the campaign. And every video you've seen people do it, it's probably been luck because there's a difference between random shotgun blasts and program shotgun blasts. The AI gets the perfect spread every time. You saw it, I was in cover and they were still hitting me. Like, that's just, oh, oh, this is what I'm doing. So, yeah, um, apologies in advance, guys. I'm going to shoot every shell of the shotgun at my team because I'm not in a good mood. Um, and, I, and I wish that this wasn't in the guide, but this is just what happens sometimes when all three of you fucking idiots are sitting in the same spot doing nothing but hugging the part I need. And if I go to these parts and they move, they hu they hug the part in front so I can't even shoot through them. So to say that I was a little bit pissed off right now is an understatement. Because I know how precious ammo is on Insane, and I would never normally waste it, but this is me just... So j just, just picture the setting, right? I have joint and muscle weakness and aches. So my back's feeling great right now. My hips are feeling great right now. I had general weakness, debilitating weakness around my body, which is always fun to feel. I had stomach cramps the entirety of this recording, so my stomach is in active revolt of my body. And all I want to do is fart, but if I do, I'll have to change my outfit. And on top of that, these motherfuckers want to sit in my spot and block my bullets. You can't imagine the depths of hatred that was seeping out of me at this point. It doesn't exist. It just doesn't. You know, it, like... <laughs> it was so miserable. And we're actually getting a moment here where the, the AI's been kind of good, which is nice. Because he's not sitting on this piece of cover blocking my shots. And oh, there he goes. So hopefully... Oh, here he goes. Spoke too soon, didn't I? But there's no reason for this to be like this, guys. Why doesn't he go down? Why doesn't he click the analog to sit down so he's not in the way of my gun? LA... LA, that's not how she's, she's called. Uh, what's her fucking name? Is it Ellie? I can't remember her name, I just like brain farted. Ellie! Ellie, there you go. I had to say it in his voice. <laughs> Naughty Dog, in my opinion, made the perfect AI with that. And even then, there was problems because I've seen forum posts of people saying that she got in the way, she gave people away for stealth, which is wrong, it's you, it's you, it's always you. She did this, she did that, she got in the way, but she didn't! She really didn't. She was great. She moved when you were about to shoot. She fucked off when she was in the way. And she helped you when you didn't think you'd need her. And that's perfect, dude. That's all you need. Look at this. This is broken. It's completely broken. Like, why won't she get that I don't want her to be there? Why don't they have some kind of hierarchy in their AI that says, Do not stand in front of the fucking player. It makes no sense. And... You're thinking, aren't you? Chris, just push forward. There's, there's cover there. Well, not only is the cover destructible, but I died twice on this section by pushing forward and getting rushed. And it's all because of this. And it need not not exist. Why don't they push forward? They're the AI. They don't give a shit. They can't die. Look at me. I'm just... Kill me. Kill me now. I want to eat whatever this organic matter is and get the worst illness where I just shit out my heart and lungs and die. Because that's how I felt when I was recording it, and it's how I wanted the characters to feel. And I finally push forward to this bit, when it's quietened down a little bit, and I think it ends up working okay, but you need to be aware here, guys, that this doorway is going to give you some issues. That was a terrible grenade. 100% my fault, and I own that. So, push forward at your own peril, and, and just try not to get frustrated like I did, because I was having a miserable time here. And this fight is literally a two-minute fight that turns into a ten-minute fight, because my team just wouldn't do shit. And I don't take any pleasure in blaming the team, except for this part. I took profound pleasure in this part because I was really mad. Like, this is why I don't do live walkthroughs, because there would be too much shouting. Like, you don't realise how mad I get when I'm doing stuff. Because games fall apart on their harder difficulties. Because you're stressing the game at the most challenging it can be, and certain mechanics just don't work the same and don't work as well. And that's why the sign of a truly great game is a game that holds up well when it is at its utmost stressful. And 
this game holds up really well for 90% of it. There's just these weird moments where bullshit happens and all the way through this game, have I mentioned that the team sucked a dick much? I haven't. I've tried not to because they didn't. But I mentioned early on that there's one part later on that I'm going to get really mad at them and that's the only part in the game where they were doing that, that bad. Everywhere else they were super good. And by super good I meant they blocked maybe one in five shots and then they fucked off. Speaking of fucking off, you need to fuck off when they get that close or you will get killed. I can't get across to you just how lethal and accurate those quills are. Once you play on insane you'll understand it. These enemies can go down easy and seem like cream puffs and other times they can seem like laser guided terrorists that will not die. Like straight up Michael Myers motherfuckers. You know, Friday the 13th, Freddy Krueger bastards. And there doesn't seem to be- whoa, that was great. I think she hit that with a charged M-bar while it was jumping. That is amazing. See what I mean? The AI can be really good. Just then, they were wonderful. They effectively won that fight for me. The fight before it, I would have hung all of them. I would have put signs on their chest of their misdeeds so that anybody else who comes past knows not to stand in front of the player when they're trying to play the game. You know, it's, it's malicious. It's straight up malicious. It's like those people on rooftops that didn't want you to get the goddamn hammer of dawn so they stood in the doorway. Bastards. And everybody saw those bastards and hated them. Sometimes you were the bastard because it was funny sometimes. <laughs> but still, like... I have no love for that fight, and I'm interested to see uh, if anybody else has had it as bad as I did, where I was getting that mad. I hope you didn't. I hope you just like, it's just you, Chris, and you had a great time, because that's the type of stuff that I was hoping that games would get away from. Just this arbitrary silliness that they seem to, to just have, because nobody fixes it. You know, nobody sees it as an issue, and, and I do, you know. I, I think the team should complement the player. I don't think they should steal the glory, and I don't want them to do all the work. I just don't want them to interfere with my work. You know, that's the thing. Like, there's so many ways to make your team do interesting stuff and have them doing cool things and moving around. Have them move between cover. Rody run to different areas. Have them flank. You don't have to have them shoot a lot. You know, give them the illusion of shooting, but but don't have them stand in the way of the player and then refuse to move for 10 minutes. Because that's a long fight, what we witnessed, and they did not move. But it's behind us now, guys, and you never have to see that shit again. Because why the fuck would you replay the campaign? There's no arcade mode. It's not the best campaign they've ever done, even though I did enjoy it. You know, there's no reason to come back here. There's none of those crazy Onyx medals that you have to get for campaign, I don't think. You know, they've, they've kind of reduced a lot of the reasons to play their game, which I found strange. But this is an interesting fight, and if you pick the decision to go up on the top side like I did, you get the easier choice here because you do not have to really contend with anything. We get to shoot fish in a barrel while our two uh, AI pals get to get bummed, and it's actually kind of cathartic watching them get slapped around by the juvies because this is what you get for not moving. And look at... did you see Del then? He was a killing machine. I don't know what Kate's doing, she's just kind of looking at them and hoping they go away with wishful thinking, which is not the way you treat a bully. But she's doing it anyway, so I'm backing her up and shooting her in the face. But look at him! He was great, wasn't he? Running around with a shotgun, taking people out, doing his job like a beast. I wonder how they're governed. I'd love to see like the debug menu and see the, the, the problem solving that they see. Like, they obviously see the enemy, they obviously know the tools, they know the choices, and they pick between those choices of what they do. He sat in cover there for 10 seconds thinking about what he's going to do, and then he insta-sprayed it with a shotgun. He could have done that at any point, or he could have missed, but he didn't, and he chose that. So it's interesting to see how, how he thinks. But <laughs> it wouldn't be Gears of War, would it, unless the technology required a rather burly man to spin a giant red wheel. This is the moment where I, I was kind of happy that they brought this feature back. And y you'll remember it from the elevator. There was another sequence there where they used it. And I love that in the future where we have all these advanced satellites and all these crazy holographic pieces of armor suits that look a little bit more like an air freshener in a car than anything a military man would wear, that we still have to turn giant valves to do menial tasks. It, it really gives me hope for the future that technology is not going to run rampant. Because look at that, over there you have some crazy Tesla generator core that's firing all kinds of cords of uh, lashing whips of electricity. And then we have this weird attorney wheelie thing, <laughs> which is a beast. 
So, that's an interesting trap. And I appreciate it because it's cheeky. It didn't work, but I still appreciate that it exists. Couple of juvies though to, to clean up after you take down the guy on the turret. Lighting here is kind of dark too, so it is kind of useful that we have these wonderful glowing splinter cell suits. Wouldn't be able to sneak up on anybody, but we, we definitely look spiffy. It must be said, as he runs away after I put a few bullets in him, love him. Why didn't he run to me? Here we come. This is scary. This is scary. Please get him, dude. Please get him, dude. Get him, dad. Get him, dad. Do not willfully watch your son die. This is bald as well. Why am I doing this? Oh, it's okay. It's okay. He didn't, uh, he didn't see me. He couldn't see me. And then there's a Boltocker. Boltocker takes off an incredible amount of damage and they are very accurate with it, so do not get shot close range. It's stupid dangerous. Ooh, love it. Love everything about it. And the cover really feels fun to move in this game. I think they've... I don't think they've quite perfected it just yet, and you know there's going to be more games because they're going to milk the tits out of this new series. But I do feel like the cover has evolved to a point now where it's about as sharp as it's ever felt. I really, really appreciate it, and I'm looking forward to, to see if I can really make a difference in the multiplayer because movement in multiplayer is one of the most important aspects of the game. Decision making on what to use in what situation is also key too. Because it's not all about shotguns and it's not all about lancers. Uh, but there you go, here comes a Scion. He has a... What is he shooting? I can't see. He's using the drop shot. And I'm just going to keep hitting him in the face until his head pops. Because this gun is incredibly powerful. And I wish I could use it more often. By the way, don't do this guys. Refill your ammo if you can and use the Mark rifle. I have this programming with gears. And it comes from the multiplayer. If once I've shot all my bullets in a gun, if someone's still alive, I swap to the snub and try and down them. Because that's what you did in the multiplayer. If you waited to reload, chances are they got in cover. Or they got revived. So I've got all this muscle memory of putting enough damage into somebody but not quite finishing the job. And then quickly swapping out. It's the same kind of muscle memory I had for COD 4. Where you swap, from your pistol instead of reload, uh, swap to your pistol instead of reloading. You know, it's, it's one of those habits that you build. And you don't lose either. And I didn't play the most of Gears of War 2. I played when it launched. I tested it out. You know, played with the friends and everybody. And I just didn't like how the game worked. I liked some of the levels, like Avalanche and things. But I, I just... I didn't like how they slowed the shotgun down and the shotgun was different. Um, I just... I don't know. It. I didn't like the smokers knocking you over and everything. And it just... It didn't feel the same to me. It felt like they'd taken something that I loved and they'd kind of cheapened it. And then Gears 3 came out and I thought Gears 3 was amazing. It just, it felt so good. I'd never felt connections like it. It was really fun. And and then unfortunately, as the year went on, the, the multiplayer got less and less active, even though it was such a great game. And I always used to resent the fact that there weren't more people playing Gears, even though it still did have a lot of decent followings. But for the most, it was always people who were just always playing it. Because every time we went on, me and my, my group of friends, we were always up against people that had re-upped, you know, a couple times. It was never just standard people who had picked up the game out of a bargain bin. It always seemed to be, you know, people who had put a lot of time in anyway. And it never bothered me because I like playing against good players because good players make you a better player. Uh, but it, it was always the same. Like, you'd see a couple thousand people online and you'd just be like, why? And then you knew at that point that there were 300 to 500,000 people playing COD and... I never thought COD were all that better. It was just easier. And I, and I think that that's a big thing. Like, There were times on, on Gears multiplayer where you wouldn't get a kill. Where you'd die immediately. Or you'd die immediately a bunch of times. And I, I reckon that that was probably too disheartening for some people. Because people don't want to have to, to learn how to play a game to be successful. They want to be just as successful immediately. And that's why a lot of games have so much bullshit put in them. And Gears is not immune to this. Because the later games, it, it got... There's all kinds of stuff they put in there to give people a chance. But in that first game, when you joined those lobbies, you had to know what you were doing or you just didn't do well. And even if you knew what you were doing, there were times you didn't do well. Like, I think there's... I, I miss something about that because it, it means more. It makes the multiplayer mean more and it makes the good players stand out. And I think nowadays, the objective of multiplayer is accessibility rather than... Uh, you know, skill ceilings and, and, and the impressiveness of playing with a good player or being a good player. 
And I don't much like that, even though I understand it, because it sells more, doesn't it? It gets more copies sold. But to me, it should be about the pursuit of being good, not the opportunity of everybody having their share. Because that just reminds me of death streaks and kill streaks that you know you sh you don't deserve, and and all that kind of the bullshit that got added to COD that ruined it for me. And I was happy that Gears never went down that path, but it still opened up a lot of things that made it way more accessible. Like the sawn off, as much as I found it hilarious, that was the re that was an excuse for people who couldn't understand how to shotgun fight. It was the gun that made sure you got a kill, but generally guaranteed that you got killed because the reload was so long. And it was kind of the it was the gun that you could give to people to make them feel like they did something without needing to be good enough to understand how to make a difference. And that to me is. It's double-sided, isn't it? Double-barreled, in a lot of ways. And don't get me wrong, guys. I loved the sawn-off. Oh my goodness, I was so dirty with that gun. If you'd have played me online, you would have hated me, because I, I just there's nothing funnier to me than running towards somebody who doesn't know you're there and l turning them into wallpaper and then running away, getting a shell in, somebody chasing you, they don't know you're on a corner and you stood there waiting and you just pop out and turn them into wallpaper. And then that's two people you've pissed off and then you've got no bullets left. <laughs> but it, there was something so dirty about that gun and I, and I really appreciated it. But I, I do think that Gears became a lot more casual when respawns and annex became kind of the base level rather than the you know the you get one life and you're done and now you have to watch people essentially play the game but here is a fight that might be worth talking about because i believe that this is a, a carrier or a courier i can't remember this guy's name carrier there you go i don't know why he'd be a courier but maybe he's a you know taking germs to places to make eggs or something maybe he couriers the uh, flying jizz monsters but this is also tricky because of the juvies. That's not what I meant to do. But, kind of worked, I guess. Or maybe didn't. So I was trying to mantle into cover and jump over it. I didn't realise just how long that cover was. <laughs> so instead, I had grenades in my hands and I grenade tagged it, which could have ended really poorly for me. But it didn't. Here comes the incendiary. And the strategy here is to hit him with as many explosives as I can, because I have quite a few of them. And can you remember how I mentioned in the last fight that if you go into the room at the end of the room, you might be able to get a cheeky corner where you can't get hit by the projectiles? This is a cheeky corner, if you've never seen one. So it doesn't look impressive, does it? Does it? it doesn't look any different to anything normal, but I can put that wall between me and him, and he goes away. And because there's a roof above me, if he tries to airdrop me, it won't touch me. And all I'm going to do, guys, is get his attention, get him to fire his special move, and block it with this room. And because he's at the perfect range to do the, the bigger one, he gets into kind of a loop of trying to hit me with these projectiles that never hit me. So uh, I get free hits on him and he keeps doing it. He just keeps doing it. And he becomes really easy because he's not a threat. He's not doing anything else and he cannot hit me. So this is a fantastic spot against this particular carrier. Which wasn't that a survival horror game back in the day carrier? I remember seeing it in like a Games Master and I never played it but I was always curious because it was of course about some kind of virus outbreak and I think it was on a spaceship. Kind of a dead space before dead space thing but I, I know that it wasn't rated the best. It was given like a 5 out of 10 or something and called kind of average and you know it never really got what it deserved or what it could have been but I remember it and I can remember the screenshot too. Kind of funny what you remember isn't it when you're when your mind wanders. But this guy takes a beating, so you're going to be shooting him for a while. And if you can get to this position, I recommend perhaps bringing a hammer burst or a second assault rifle or something. Two lancers would be useful here, because at least then you can do consistent damage without having to worry about wasting ammunition. There's definitely a guilt that comes with using the bigger guns on sequence. Oh, is that good or bad? That was okay. Is he dead? He's dead. So that wasn't too bad, I don't think. I've got no bullets left, which is kind of what this game does. And then it'll force a fight on us in the next room, and we've got no bloody bullets, which is a little bit cruel, but it does it a lot, that. And I was speaking about it on an earlier video, wasn't I, about taking weapons between uh, checkpoints and between levels and between deaths, which is an interesting balance in a game. 
and it makes it interesting when you know that that's how it works but at the same time it can drop you in the shit a lot which it sucks when it drops you in the shit it's awesome when you've got the good gear and it doesn't take it off you but how do you make it work all the time perhaps they could give us an option of a restart where it refreshes the weapons or I think the easiest way to do it would be just to recycle the ammunition starters with a basic clip of whatever the weapon is you're carrying if you've got a boom shot give us two booms you know give us if it's a special weapon give them half the standard amount of ammunition it would have if you picked it up raw because don't you get four booms when you pick them up off the ground generally sometimes you'll get three when you pick ammo up but the average is about four isn't it so give us two booms you know give us two talks give us what is the sniper like the snipers eight give us four sniper shots just just give us a little bit of something so that we're not there with our fucking pants down and you're there with the KY and a dirty grin. You know, we need something. Because some of the fights that you have to contend to if you don't have the stuff become a nightmare. There's a fight coming up when we get separated here that's a really tricky fight. And it's tricky for one reason. Because they don't give you a checkpoint and... I've tried my best not to bang on too much about the checkpoints, and I already have a little bit, but I haven't gone nuts as what I would have liked to have, because there's only so many ways you can lament and condemn checkpoints in games, and there comes a time when you have to appreciate that not everybody feels the same, so just because I don't like the way they deliver the resets doesn't mean that there aren't people who think that it, it works fine. And if they come to this video for help, they don't want to listen to me say that this should be here and you're thinking, no, it shouldn't. Because, you know, that's one of the the joys of having different opinions. As we stop, I really liked this moment, by the way. I like the idea of getting on here, but then they didn't do anything with it. I really wanted us to press a button on that and I wanted it to rotate around and have another one rotating and have Locust on the other one. And it'd be kind of like those moments in Vanquish where you're on those awesome pieces of cover that are moving. And I love that about Vanquish. Vanquish had really creative setups for just standard shooting. And I think that's one of its strengths. Whereas when you come to a game like this, I think they slip into this complacency of, you know, linearity, chest high wall, arena, 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 arena. And the arenas are oftentimes really simple. And it says something about a game in the Act 4, you know, that, that latter act before the finale, the darkest moment, and then the, the ultimate light at the end. Like, the complacency is definitely palpable at that point, I think, because you get to the, the area of a game like this, and especially in this dam, when we move through this dam, you feel like you're moving through this dam, going from fight to fight to fight to fight, messing with that elevator, and you definitely feel that, because the magic is not there and it's not because it's not fun and it's not because what you're doing isn't that interesting it's just that they don't present it in a way that continues to challenge your imagination so you realize that all you're doing is sitting behind some corrugated fence and shooting more locust like if we'd have gone onto that circular wheel and it had started shifting and all the terrain had been moving and it had altered our perspective and our axis on how we fought then you'd be like whoa this is different but it didn't. Instead, it's just a standard fight. And, like, there comes a time when you analyse it, from my perspective anyhow, where you look at it and you think, when does a standard fight become too samey? And when do we mix it up? There will be people who do this encounter and get to this point in this level who don't feel that way, who feel like it's just the in-between to the next section and they have fun. But there will be people who get to this point who kind of really feel like this is just oh, another fight and another fight and another fight and there's not enough spice and diversity between the sequences to make you want the next sequence and I was really hoping that the robots were going to turn up at this point and there was going to be kind of the war situation of robots fighting swarm and us in the middle and this interesting three-way triangle of really dynamic battlefields I thought that could have been really cool and something like that does end up occurring but it's just not really an emphasis, it's not something they care about. And one of the things I was really hoping for when it comes to just next generation of consoles is next generation of AI because AI has been the same level of good for a long time now and I appreciate that you know how much better can it get is probably increments and it's nothing too m large but I would like a judgment-based AI that picks a side and commits to it until the greater risk is done and then betrays you. 
I think that could be cool. Or doesn't betray you and just kind of sticks with you. That'd be really interesting to see an enemy that at any moment could fragile a lion shit. And next thing you know, you're a copper coming back trying to shoot him because he, you know, he just murks you from behind while you were picking diamonds up from the front of that mall. But just the idea of the locust realizing that the robot is the bigger threat and favoring to be closer to you than to it without doing that miracle bullshit where they turn around and kill you. Because there's nothing worse than, oh, there's two, two factions fighting. I'll go and get in the middle of this and instantly they both turn at you and they're all fucking lasering you. And it's just like Stranglehold multiplayer with Aiden, which uh, I've told this before in, in some commentaries, but if you never heard it, me and Aiden played the Stranglehold multiplayer, and because it was so dead, it was generally just me and him. So what would happen is, is when a person did tur turn up and, and, and be here, because we didn't want to play too much of this, because it wasn't that great when it was just us, it was funny, but without opponents, it's boring. So we wanted to get the achievements and leave, so we would pretend to shoot each other, like, oh, I'm going to kill you, bang, 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 and, you know, obviously miss and make it look quite theatrical. And then the moment the third person who we didn't know came along, we would instantly murder them <laughs> and go into super sexy action mode. And we had this ruse of essentially, like, hustling people. And we did it until we got the achievements and then we stopped playing and it was hilarious. But that's what the AI does. Oh, we will have this fight, we hate each other, and then they just kill you. That to me is dog shit because it's just boring. It's not how it should be, but it oftentimes is how it works. And this is one of my favourite rooms in the game. Can remember how I said moments earlier? It'd be nice if those wheels would have turned and we would have had some kind of environmental interesting feature. This is interesting. This is dynamic cover shifting and moving, which can also become dangerous. So the cover can be great in a saviour, but it can also be your, you know, your doomsayer and your demise. It's really cool. There's only two rooms in the game that utilise it, but I enjoy both of them. And there's a wonderful section coming up where I'm waiting for a scion to turn up and he's already been killed by the moving components of this mechanism. And I think that's fascinating and awesome. I really, really like this. The only way that this could have got better is if we were on the chains when they were moving and you had to be and you were jumping between the chains with like, you know, forward and A and you'd hopped across like on Bayonetta when you're on the cars or something. Or a little bit like Uncharted between the vehicles in those carrot, you know, those convoy sections. I think that could have been great. Like, this could have been the back of a giant robot of some sort that was a boss and you were doing all incursions on its back and destroying cores and then you fought its front or something. That could have been crazy. But it's just, it's one of those ideas that somebody thought of, put, put it in here for some weird reason. I don't know why there would be a bunch of chains getting messed around in this section, but they are. And then it's gone again. And it's the most interesting thing we've seen all act. And, and it's actually pretty tricky too, but it's tricky for them. And I love that. I love the idea that it's just as dangerous for your opponent and it is, it is for us. So, touche on whoever got this into the game, but I really appreciate this room. Uh, it definitely reminds me of that particular room in Devil May Cry, you know, DMC, where there's the saws and things moving. It reminds me a little bit of that bit, but this is just cool. And it's really fair too, because if you look at the floor, you can see where the heated metal residue is, where it's pierced the ground, and it shows you where the impact zones are, and as long as you're nowhere near them, you don't die. So it's really, really fair. I love this area, it's so cool, and I'm using a peacemaker or a, a shock rifle at long range, which is not the best tool, but I really like this weapon, so bear with me guys. But there's your checkpoint, and I'm really hoping there's a multiplayer level that uses this mechanic, because that's where this shines. When you're having a really tense one-on-one -on -one fight against somebody and all the cogs are moving and it's crazy and there's cover suddenly, it'll be just like John Travolta and Nicolas Cage in Face Off when they're at the mirror. It'll be so sweet. But a lot of oil leaking around as well. This is a part about the about the section where I thought we were going to be taking on robots, but we never did uh, in this particular zone. And as I've already mentioned in the guide, the the robots are getting uh, quite a lot of stick from from people. It seems they're not a fan of the robots. They just think it makes gears look generic. And I get it because I felt the same about the helicopters and the plane. Like I don't want to fight planes and helicopters in gears. It's never been something that I think Gears has needed because it's always had Reavers and corpses and some kind of flying problem, nemesis, you know? It's always had that kind of organic matter situation. So when you're fighting against a really impersonal helicopter, 
it just feels like every other game you've ever played because we've killed a lot of helicopters in gaming now. Helicopters are a, a big trope. But do you know why they're a trope, guys? Because they're always the fucking same. They never change how you fight the helicopter. They don't. Like, the most interesting helicopter fight I've seen in recent memories was Metal Gear Rising. Because all you did was wait for it to fire missiles and you ran up them and killed it. And that's cool. Or you fired the Psy at it and electrocuted it and it came down and then you sliced it to bits. That's a cool way of having a helicopter fight. But when it's just hit it a million times with stingers and RPGs and then it eventually fucks off while you hide. You know, Metal Gear Solid did that back in the 90s and it did it as, as good as it was ever going to be done. Like, the Harrier fight, I think, is kind of beautiful, but that's just because it's super intense and really scary, and you can actually guide the rocket, so it feels cool. And you can dodge the Harrier, too. It's not about just being in cover the entire time. You can do really cool techniques to get around the missiles, and every time, you know, Solidus says something, you know what's coming, because it's really well designed. But nowadays, it's just, oh, here comes a helicopter, sit in cover, fire stinger, sit in cover, fire stinger, run to ammo, refill, sit in cover, fire stinger, do it three times, get your checkpoint, move on, chest high wall, the game. We don't need that anymore, we've done that. There's, there needs to be a point now where that's not a thing, and it moves on. Same with tanks, like, we've got Battlefield 1 coming out in less than 10 days. It's the next guide you're going to be seeing, guys, and it's going to come out really quick to way quicker than this, because first-person shooters, usually short. And I'm going to be doing it on hard difficulty. And I am afraid that that game is just going to recycle fucking tank bosses like they always do. And bunker fights like they always do. Clear the bunker. You know, I want it to have fucking zeppelins and, and really strange missions and just super creative stuff that you wouldn't expect. Because they're using the technology and they're doing it on a grander scale. But you know there's going to be a zone where a tank turns up and you've got to drop bombs or mines or, or get on top of it and chuck grenades in it or something. Because it's just, unfortunately at the moment, I don't think technology is the limit. I think the limit is the creative people. And I think we've got a lot of creative people who are potentially not allowed to do creative things because it's too risky. So instead of doing creative shit, here's another fucking tank fight that mirrors every tank you've ever fought. And to me, it's very sad. I had a conversation on Twitter with somebody about features that were missing from Gears of War 4 and they were playing Devil's Advocate and telling me a few reasons why they might be missing and as much as I appreciate you know the discourse of somebody putting a different perspective forward essentially their argument was you know it wasn't successful so why do it and they didn't say it in those words and I'm not trying to make this person sound like a villain or anything but to me I look at it for the same way if we look at games from a perspective of how many people play it, how many people like it, and how much money it makes. That's the death of creativity, that's the death of doing things differently. That's the death of innovation, because all you're going to get then are sequels that stay so safe, they're not even worth playing because you've already played them, just in a different wrapper, and for a different price zone, in a different month, of a different year. And nobody wants that, really. You might think you want that, but there'll come a time when you just get fed up of it because you get so burnt out. And... To me, I would love games to take more risks, and even if they don't pay off, at least they had the balls to do it. And that's what I don't understand. I can't understand a mentality that doesn't want a developer to take risks. And, you know, it, it's just that strange thing. Popularity does sell, you know. They will always go to the lowest common denominator. This is just how the world works. That's the reason why there's a 50 fucking Madden games and 50 FIFA games. Because the the popular, they're incrementally different each time, but essentially you are selling these people who love this sport the same game every year. And they're buying it for the improvements, which are so incremental that people who have no idea how to play those games would not even notice them. This guy has shaved legs. This guy has leg technology on his socks. Like, great. Awesome. The new pass, aggressive, intelligent, triple D system. Like, wonderful. Dryness dives and blah. Awesome. But it doesn't mean a lot to somebody unless you're super deep. And when it comes to things like Gears, I wanted this to have something crazy, something different, something weird. Like, can you imagine a horde mode where you can competi like, compete against another human, and it's the human who does the spawns for the horde mode, doesn't control the, the, the locust, but picks where the emergence halls come from, picks where the, the heavy monster comes in, you know, picks the groupings of enemies. That could be cool as shit. 
You could even have one of those novelty smart glass adverts where there's people of every creed, colour and, and what have you from every part of the world sat in a McDonald's on tablets that nobody owns doing, Oh look, I just fired a grenade! Ha ha ha! Like that kind of shit with those stupid adverts. Could make one of them, you know? I just totally chainsawed your chainsaw. Ha ha ha! You know, you could have you could have done so much with it. But no, we'll not have that because that was that Fable game, wasn't it? And it got cancelled because why not? Look at Prey 2. Prey 2 looked fucking cool. It looked like Blade Runner bounty hunting in space. What does it look like now? A rip off of fucking Dead Space that I don't think looks exciting at all. Like, I've seen more exciting things flush away in my toilet. Just, no. It's not what I'm excited for. And they're calling it Prey. It's not Prey. There's no Indians. There's no Tomasi. It's not id. Like, come the fuck out. I don't, it might be it. I don't know anything about that game. I just watched that E3 video and thought it looked underwhelming. Oh my god, they're in space and shit's happening. Really? We haven't seen that before. Never anything gone wrong in space, right? But this is a tough fight, so enough of my sass. Imagine two waves of, of locust or swarm attacking you two on the left and the two on the right, because you are separated here. And then the moment that you finish this fight, there's going to be a snatcher. Without a checkpoint. So if the Snatcher comes for you, you better pray it dies or you're gonna die. If the Snatcher comes for your people on the side, then this fight becomes very easy. But the problem is you do not control where the Snatcher goes, he's up to him. And uh, the first attempt at this, he came for me, I backed up and he ended up killing me. The second attempt is the one you're watching and it went really smoothly because I have both a, a talk bow that I can get and I have one of the drop shots, so between the drop shot and the talk bow, you can put so much damage on the Snatcher, it just doesn't live very long. But it's all about not being able to control the game at this point. So what I'm going to do here is, there is a couple of elites with talk bows, so be very careful. Uh, they can, if they want to, just look at you and instantly talk you. Uh, this is an awesome opportunity to watch the rain bounce off of JD's shoulder pad as well, off his pauldron, it looks really cool. But Whenever it says hold Y on the screen, that means that the Snatcher's on its way. So I immediately get the talk bow on. I get into cover just in case he changes his mind. And then I'm going to put as many shots down range as I can. And hopefully do big damage to him. Because as long as he stays over there, we are not in any kind of risk. And if he starts downing people and picking them up, he's playing into our strategy. But instead he's trying to snipe them. And it was really successful. So there goes the first guy. And now you get to experiment with the grenade gun, the drop shot. So aim high, hold it, and release. Aim high, hold it, release. Do not get too close. This is real dangerous. Thankfully, the breath didn't touch me. And there you go. He drops our buddy. And this is when it gets dangerous too, but I think that killed it. Yeah, that killed it. So there you go. Looks kind of simple, doesn't it? It's not. That's a scary fight, that one. If the Snatcher's AI gets really fancying you, and it gets all smitten with us then it gets challenging, but as long as it doesn't, you should be okay. Refill on your weapons, refill on your talk bows. Um, there is a boss coming up on the next level. It's at the end of a rather large fight, which is going to be way slower than it needed to be because I got chainsawed at the end of it and I lost the duel. It's a famous story by this point because I've mentioned it so many times. But it's a video that you're probably going to need because the Swarm Mac fight is really shitty. And I don't say that because I take any pleasure in insulting the game. I say that because I don't think the Coalition knows what good boss fights are, because I haven't seen one yet. Like, even in Judgment, I don't think Judgment had the best fights, because they keep on relying on this idea that throwing a shit ton of dudes in the room with you with talk bows is a good idea, and I don't think that is. And in this game, it's mulchers, it's mulchers, it's juvies, it's, it's, it's unnecessary. And if I ever become a lecturer of gaming philosophy or gaming... Um, shall we say, principles and design? Because let's face it, there's no right and wrong answer, is there, when it comes to teaching games, in my opinion, because they're so creative. There are just, here's where this was done well, and here's where this was done poorly. And, and derivatives of this, because everyone's going to have a different view of certain things. It's like teaching art. You can't teach art, I don't think. You can teach the history of art, and you can teach the technique, but I don't think you can teach art as a whole, because it's too amorphous, it's too transcendental, it's... What is art? You know, it's a tricky question. But we're pushing forward, past the pustules, past the, the corpses of our past glories, and onto the, the final half of the game, or the latter quarter. And there's, there's no real standout fights on the, 
chap on Act 5, because Act 5 is really short and the final boss is actually really easy. It just does massive damage, so you die a lot, so it looks harder than it is. But there is a couple of decent fights that are going to test you between here and then. And hopefully I'm going to be there to, to help you out if you need some guidance. And hopefully you've enjoyed the, the project so far, because uh, this was rife with adversity, but we got there, you know. And, and I'm definitely proud of this one, because... There's a part of me that really wants to keep cover the Gears Ultimate Collection, but there's also a part of me that just feels like it's so redundant at this point. There's so many strategies and guides already on YouTube, and Gears 1 just isn't that difficult now. If you know how to control spawns and get rid of emergence holes and be aggressive in that game, you can end most of the fights before they begin. And a lot of the bosses in the tough sections, like, you can kill the corpse with the snub, if you know what you're doing. Sounds like it shouldn't work, but it does, you know? And then, of course, Ram. You can get him stuck and kill him with a shotgun in about 10 seconds, so you're not going to struggle with him. And if you're the type of person that's looking online for help, you're not the type of person that's too proud to do that. But thank you for watching anyhow, and you take care now.